Thanks so much, Paul. Appreciate you and the worship team leading us this morning. You know, it's true that God is in pursuit of us with reckless abandon. So many times we think that we have to get to God, and that's an impossible proposition. God knew it, and so He didn't leave us to our own devices. Instead, He came to rescue us. As Scripture says, He sent His Son, Jesus, having salvation. Exactly what we need. Now, the curious thing about God's reckless pursuit of men, women, boys, and girls is that oftentimes in His pursuit of us, He uses people. In fact, the reckless pursuit of my life began, curiously enough, with one Mr. McKinney. In fact, if it were not for Mr. McKinney, I am certain that I wouldn't be here this morning. And Mr. McKinney, by the way, gave a simple invitation to my family that um, they ought to come to Revival Night at First Baptist Church of Carrizozo, New Mexico. That was back in 1953. Of course, I wasn't born yet, but God's pursuit of me started long before I was ever even thought of with my grandparents. And uh, I, I've told this story many times before. I'll tell it many times again because I just can't get over the fact that God was looking for the rough and tumble characters of James and Venus Stoneman. And here's a picture of them. They look like a happy lot, don't they? James and Vina, Carrizozo, New Mexico. They're standing in front of, um, well, wait for that one for a second. To go, go back. They're, they're, they're standing in front of the school bus that my grandfather drove in front of the general store that they owned, which didn't have electricity or indoor plumbing. They lived in the back of it. It was also a post office in the wide spot they call Carrizozo, New Mexico. And here in this place, my grandfather and grandmother, who were uh, honky-tonking, foul-mouthed, nasty-spirited, mean-to-the-bone people who had never darkened the door of a church, were invited by Mr. McKinney to come to pack a pew night. In fact, I think the conversation went something like this. Mr. McKinney said to my grandfather, who was really not approachable. In fact, this is what my my grandfather did with his brother during the Depression days is that they would go from town to town and they would fist fight each other for the money that people would throw into the ring. That's why his, his nose in a minute you're going to see is a, a little bit smushed, right? This is what, I mean, this is the kind of a guy he, he was. He was the kind of guy that if you went up and said something to him, he would beat the snot out of you just because you looked at him cross. He was a drunk he regularly beat my father, who was the oldest of five kids in the picture. There's four of them, but number five is the biscuits in the oven, right? Number five is coming. And they, they were trying to eke out an existence in this godforsaken land of New Mexico where life was hard and they were harder. And Mr. McKinney said, excuse me, Mr. Stoneman, I would like for you to be my honored guests at pack a pew night at the revival at the church house. Would you come? And I'm sure that the uh, conversation with my grandmother was a little uh, iffy. Hey, Vina, pack up the kids. We're going to the church meeting house. Say what? We're going where? Mr. McKinney has asked us to be his honored guests. And I told him that we would be happy to oblige. And the first time that my grandparents walked through the door of a church was the first time that they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ was the moment that God had planned to supernaturally intervene into their lives. And both of them put their faith in Christ on that first night. And from that moment... Their lives changed. In fact, look at their faces up close, see? Rough and tumble. There's not a lot of joy there. There's not a lot of, of happiness there. There's not, 
a lot of anticipation that God was about to change their lives forever. And you know, Mr. McKinney, he was only doing what the scripture told him to do. In fact, in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 20, it says, God has given us the task. Hear that? You and I who have already put our faith in Jesus Christ, we have been given a task of reconciling people to God. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. And this is the wonderful message that he's given to us to tell others. We are Christ's ambassadors, and God is using us to speak to you. We urge you, as though Christ himself were here pleading with you to be reconciled to God. Now listen, what, what happens when you, in faith, turn to Christ and are set free from your sins? You are saved. Saved from your sin, saved from yourself, saved from disastrous ruin, saved from destruction and death, and saved for life, and life abundant in Jesus Christ. Life that is filled with the purpose and passion of Christ. Life that is filled with the Holy Spirit. God himself taking up residence inside of the believer and then producing fruits in our lives, starting with the fruit of repentance and moving forward to the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Listen, when you have received the gift of God, forgiveness of sin, redemption by the blood of Jesus Christ, when you have experienced supernatural intervention, things change. You change. And the evidence of this change is undeniable. Look at the after picture. <laughs> this is several years after. Of course, my father's no longer in the picture. He's off at college. And you say, what happened to these people? I'll tell you what happened to these people. Jesus Christ got into the middle of their muddle. Jesus Christ invaded their lives, and by faith, they put their trust in Jesus Christ, and they shared in the benefit of the good news, and their lives were forever changed. In fact, my grandfather never took another drink, never. In fact, my, uh, all of my aunts and uncles, my dad, grew up understanding that alcohol wasn't something that you played with because... It was a tool in the devil's handbox, right, to get people off course. And so my mom and dad never had alcohol in the house because my dad said, look, I don't know how many drinks it's going to take for me to become an alcoholic. And I say the same thing. That's why I don't have alcohol in my house. I don't know how many drinks it's going to take for my daughter or my son to become an alcoholic. I don't want them to find out. Why? Our heritage is we were set free from the bondage of that slavery. Our family has been, and so we're not going to start that again. But listen, they're changed. And you know what happened as a result of their change? They got a great passion for the least, the last, the lost. Every place that they moved, my grandparents were compelled to go and find the people who had never heard the good news. Usually what it ended up is they ended up in the barrios, the places where the laborers who were brought in from, from at that, that time, from Mexico, that's where they housed themselves, and there was nobody bringing the good news to them. Nobody caring about them. So my grandmother and grandfather said, hey, where, where should we, wh what should we do with our lives other than the, their vocations? What should we do? And they said, we should invest it in people telling them the good news because Mr. McKinney told us the good news. We should bring that to others. And so everywhere they went, they would establish these little mission churches. Now, my grandfather was not a pastor, but he had changed from a cantankerous beat you up for you know, looking at him wrong to somebody who wanted to tell you about how God could change your life, and he had a testimony. He would tell that testimony. They would start a little church. My grandmother, she would start um, what we would call a preschool, and she would, even though she only had like a sixth grade education, she would bring in all the the, the little kids who were left out, marginalized, they didn't go to regular kindergarten because they couldn't even speak English. And she brought them in. She started teaching them 
their ABCs and taught them English. And, and, and then when they were ready to go to, to kindergarten and first grade, they were, they were ready because somebody took some time to invest in them. I'm telling you, their lives changed. And it was undeniable the change that happened in their lives. And, and that flows down uh, to me. And my life changed because of a simple invitation by Mr. McKinney to go to a pack, a pew night, where my grandparents first heard the good news of Jesus Christ. Now listen, transformation from dead to alive is not a self-help proposition. That Paul has said that he's already established that in Romans. And he has pointed out in Romans 9 and now in Romans 10 that Uh, He has a great love for the people of Israel, and his love is that they might hear the good news of Jesus Christ and ditch their thought that they could live lives that would be pleasing to God and that they could somehow uh, merit a righteousness by their own good works. And Paul has said that's not going to be enough because unless you're perfect, that's not enough. Paul wants to point these Israelites, these Jews, to Jesus Christ. The only way to be reconciled to God is through Jesus Christ. And that's where we jump back into our study of Romans this morning. So if you brought your Bible with you this morning, I hope that you did, I invite you to join me in Romans chapter 10, and we'll be looking at verses 4 through 13. I know, can you believe it's such a big passage? We're going to really make some, some... some time and cover some ground this morning. And here's what God's word says. It's Paul writing to the Christ followers in Rome. He says, look, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses describes it in this way, the righteousness that is by law. The man who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says Do not say in your hearts who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your hearts. That is the word of faith that we're proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So take note again of verse 4. That's where we ended last week. We covered it a little bit, but I said there was more. It says this, Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. This is the point that Paul is going to be trying to prove in the following verses. That Christ is enough. That Christ is all there is. That Christ is the end of the law so that there might be righteousness for all who simply believe. Now, believe it or not, this is a highly debated uh, verse among Bible scholars. And the debate really swirls around the word end. What does end mean? In Greek, it's the word telos, which its meaning it can be multitude. There's a lot of different meanings associated to telos, right? And so it, what it can mean is end. That's how it's translated in, in IV, end. But even think about English, end, it has a lot of different meanings. Does it mean like that with Jesus' death and, and, and burial and resurrection that the law was terminated? It came to a end? Or does it mean that end like in in a goal, that Christ's goal, the end of the law, was to point people in the direction of Christ? See how that might change it a little bit, a nuance? Or can it mean 
fulfillment or culmination in the sense that all of the Old Testament types and, and rituals and sacrifices pointed to and were fulfilled in Christ Jesus. In fact, that's what Jesus said in Matthew 5, 17. You might remember he said, I did not come to ab- abolish the law, but to what? To fulfill the law. And all of those nuances, by the way, are true in regard to Christ, but the difficult question is, which one does Paul intend in Romans 10, 4? Thomas Schreier, who is a a Bible commentator convincingly said, look, you have to look back at verse 3 and take verse 3 and 4 together, and what you see is that end means termination in an experiential sense. In other words, in verse 4, Paul is responding to the specific Jewish error mentioned in verse 3, that they use the the law to try to establish their own righteousness. He said, look, you can't can't establish your own righteousness. That is a failing proposition. You need somebody to come who will fulfill it for you. And this is who Jesus is. So Paul is saying those who trust in Christ cease using the law to establish their own righteousness. And they must fall upon the grace and mercy of God displayed in His Son, Jesus Christ, to have righteousness imputed into them. And that way they would be made perfect and then could have relationship with God. Another Bible commentator says this, Paul's contention regarding the Jew is is not the incompleteness of his position which needed the coming of Christ to perfect, but the absolute wrong of the position because what it entailed is an effort to establish righteousness by human effort rather than accepting the divine gift. So that's why the law had to come to an end because they were using it to try to fulfill the law and they couldn't do that. In fact, the law had already told them that they couldn't live up to it. They needed somebody to save them. So he's trying to say, hey, ditch the keeping of the law as a means of righteousness to get to God and instead receive the grace that He's provided in His Son, Jesus Christ, His blood as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. One more commentator says this, Paul means that belief in Christ as Savior ends the sinner's futile quest for righteousness through his imperfect attempts to save himself by his efforts to obey the law. So Paul establishes that Christ is the end of the law so that there might be righteousness for everyone who believes. And then he's going to give three compelling proofs to show that that is true. Proof number one is what Moses said. Moses describes it this way. Paul is going to quote Moses. The righteousness that is by the law. Here's how Moses saw the righteousness that comes by the law. The man who does these things will live by them. So Paul Remember, he used to be a Pharisee before he became a believer, which means that he had a vast knowledge of the Old Testament, probably had the first five books of the Old Testament committed to memory. So he's pulling on this vast knowledge he has about the Old Testament, and he pulls out of it Leviticus 18.5. Now, if you've ever gotten to uh, read through the Scripture You never get to Leviticus 18.5. You always quit by about Leviticus, you know, 9. Because it is, Leviticus is a hard book to get through, right? But here, Paul remembers something of his training in the Old Testament. And he remembers what Moses wrote down in Leviticus 18.5. Now listen, you don't need a PhD in Old Testament letters to understand why Paul is using this verse. It's clear to understand that Paul is insisting something about righteousness that comes by the law. He's saying it's not enough that you perfectly know the law. You must perfectly live the law. And get this, it means not just what you do. It also means what you think and the attitude that you hold about obeying that law which simply means that if it's up to mere men 
to make themselves righteous by keeping the law, it is a failed proposition. There's no way that you and I can do it. Take note, Moses does not tone down the law to suit our fallen state or to talk about our doing our best. Well, we did the best we could. God should be satisfied with our imperfect obedience. No, he says this, he that does those things, that is, live by the law, uh, those who, who keep the law must live by them. In other words, Moses is demanding perfect and entire obedience if the law is going to bring life to us. He does not say that, well, if you've broken the law, then there might be some other means of your salvation. No, if the law is broken once, it's all over in regard to your salvation by the law. And in case you were thinking that this was not always the case, listen to what Ezra 9.15 says. Oh Lord, God of Israel, you are righteous. Get that? God is righteous. We are left this day as a remnant. Here we are before you in our guilt. These are people who had the law and they're saying we couldn't keep it. Here we are before you, God, in our guilt, though because of it, our guilt, not one of us can stand in your presence. These are people, like all mankind, who might know the law, but they cannot keep it to secure their salvation. Maybe you think, well, those were Old Testament dudes. They're not righteous like I am. Maybe you think you're an exception to this rule. Remember, Paul uh, writing back in Romans 3.23, he, he wrote a stirring um, assertion about all of us. He said, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And did you know that Paul was just reiterating what was already revealed in the Old Testament from 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46, which says there is no one who does not sin. Paul's just reiterating, look, all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. He's just saying it in another way, but the truth is still there. But here's the good news that 1 Kings did not deliver to us, but Paul does. He says it like this in Romans 3, 23 through 25, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, we know that. And here's the hope that's added into the equation, are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Him as a sacrifice of atonement. How? Through faith in His blood. This is how we come to a place of being saved. We don't secure it ourselves by keeping the law because we cannot. And God knew that. And so he did wade into the middle of our muddle. He came bringing us what we needed the most, salvation. How did he secure it? By his son, Jesus Christ, whose blood was shed, whose body was broken in order that you and I who believe in him, you and I that might have faith in him, would be saved. Now it's clear then to every man that the only way of salvation if it were by works of the law, is to keep the law perfectly. And that road is closed. And the sooner we accept that that road is closed, the better. By the way, James and Venus Stoneman never thought that they were going to get to heaven by their good works. Why? It was self-evident to them. They had lived a harrowing life. They had been abused and they had heaped that abuse on others. The only hope that they had was the good news that God was with reckless abandon seeking to save those who are lost. He did so by sending his son. The sooner we understand that we can't make ourselves better, the sooner we'll turn our thoughts in the right direction and travel on the way that the Lord and great mercy has prepared for us. Listen, this is what Moses said. Paul's just quoting Moses. We should hear it and be humbled. But Paul has just begun to prove his point that Christ is the end of the law so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Not only, he says, listen to what Moses says, but proof number two, he says, listen to what the gospel says. You need to listen to what the gospel says. And here's what the gospel says. 
He says, but the righteousness that is by faith, that's what we want to hear about now. We want to hear about some righteousness that isn't uh, coddled up by us, that isn't uh, somehow manufactured by us. We, we need righteousness that is imputed to us, that's given to us as a gift. It says, the righteousness that is by faith says, ooh, the gospel speaks. What does it say? It says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? It says the word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your hearts. That is the word of faith that we're proclaiming. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him up from the dead, you will be saved. Three things I want to point out to you that the gospel says. Very important. First is this. The gospel is plain or better, it's uncomplicated. In other words, there's not a myriad of of steps and hoops to jump through before you can have the realization that God wants to give you the gift, and the gift is life in His Son, Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sin. He wants to redeem you from the worthless way of life that you used to live, and He wants to put you, He wants to transport you into His glorious light so that you can live as children of God. That's good news. It's not complicated. It's plain. Here's the gospel. You ready for it? Believe and live. That's it. Believe and live. Verse 9 tells us just like it is the one who who bets his his righteousness on the law. Do and, and live, Moses would say. But we can't do. And so we're gonna die. Except God has gotten into the middle of our model. God has moved on our behalf and he's made the path of faith simple and clear. Believe, that is, put your faith and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross. His death, his burial, his resurrection has been enough to save you. Believe. The righteousness of faith says, if you believe, you will be saved. And Jesus himself declares this truth on many occasions. In John chapter 6, verse 47, Jesus says, Verily, verily, or that's King James Version, Very truly I say to you, the one who, what? Believes. Has eternal life. Famously, John 3, 16 Jesus says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, here it comes again, believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The gospel is plain. Believe and live. Or you can try to keep the law as your means of righteousness. You will, you will fail and die. Well, what else does the gospel say? Not only that it's plain, believe and live, but the gospel also forbids questions of despair. Let me explain. In a brilliant move, Paul skillfully takes these words right out of the mouth of Moses and alters them just a bit so that we can apply it to the gospel. Here's Moses' words to the people of Israel about, hey, we we just can't understand God. He said, hey, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. And here's the comment that Paul makes about that to apply it to the gospel. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? We're going to see that in just a second. But what is this all about, this ascending, this descending? Well, listen, when men, women, boys, and girls become aware of the reality of sin in their lives, when their hearts are awakened to the dreadful and inescapable truth that they are dead in their sins, questions of despair flood their soul. They ask themselves then, well, what must I do to rise to heaven? 
I must have a righteousness of intense, perfect labor to make that climb, or, or I'll, I'll need an atonement of, for sin so great that I would need to suffer divine anger and be plunged to the abyss itself. So the question is, what things can I perform which by I might be saved? And listen, the gospel forbids such questions. Why? Because it's already been done in Jesus Christ. There is no what can I do. The answer has been plain and simple. You believe, you receive, you turn, and you live. In other words, do not say that the way to heaven is hard. Do not say that it is mysterious and, uh, and, and far from your being able to understand it. Don't say anything apart from the simple act that you must believe. The gospel forbids questions of despair because it has already gloriously answered them through Christ's finished work on the cross. You don't have to bring Christ down. He's already come down. Haven't you heard? That's why we celebrate Christmas. He's come down to live among us to show us what God was like. He was tempted in all ways just as we were but never succumbed. He lived perfectly without sin and was mocked and was beaten and was spit upon, falsely accused and then nailed to the tree. He hung there in agony, his blood spilling like a flood to free sinners from their sin. And his last words gloriously have application to you and I who believe it is finished. And salvation at that moment was bought for whosoever will believe. And salvation lies in this. You need not to climb into heaven as if you could. Heaven came down, and as a, storm, as a song used to say, and glory, the glory of Christ has filled our souls. You don't need to, to ask who will descend and pay the price for our sin in hell in despair. Because here is your answer. You need not bring Christ up again from the dead. As the song we sing says, Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with him again. Come awake, come awake, and you rise from the grave. Paul begs this question, but what does it say? What does it say? What does it say? What does the gospel say? And again, quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 14, he says, I'll tell you what it says. It says, the Lord, the word is near you. How near? In your mouth and in your heart. And now Paul's commentary, that is the word of faith that we're proclaiming. That very thing that the the word of God is near you. All you need to do is believe. All you need to do is receive it. That God loved the world so much that he sent his son. And if you'll just believe, if you'll confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You know what it means? Number three is this. The gospel is accessible. Christ saves us as we trust. It's not rocket science here. It's not hidden to you. The Word of God is near you. What is the Word? That if you confess and if you believe, you will, take my, you, you will um, be saved. But listen, don't take my word for it. Listen to proof number three, what Scripture says. Scripture here is talking about the Old Testament. Because before the New Testament was written, the Old Testament was written as a, as a plan of what God was going to do. In fact, in Isaiah 28, 16, as Paul quotes it here in Romans chapter 10, he says, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Trust in who? Trust in the Messiah that's going to come. Trust in the Christ who has come, who was nailed to a cross, blood was shed, body was broken in order that you and I who believe could have imputed into us the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And I want you to see who it is who could respond 
You see that great word there? It says anyone. Anyone, Jew, Gentile, anyone. Whatever man in the entire world throughout all the ages who trusts in Jesus Christ will never be put to shame. I don't care if you're the butcher, the baker, or the candlestick maker. If you trust in Jesus Christ, you will be saved, redeemed, bought back, born again, set free from the ravages of sin and the the grip of death and given life and life abundant and a birthright as sons who will then collaborate with God in the redemption of the world. See? First, you have to be invited And once you receive the invitation and you respond by believing, then you become those who are inviting. It's beautiful. James and Venus Stoneman were invited, and not too long after they invited, well, the very night they were invited, they they came to, to faith in Jesus Christ. And you know what then happened to their lives? They became inviting, collaborating with God as he pursued men, women, boys, and girls that they might hear and respond as well to the good news of life in Jesus Christ. Just as was recorded in Joel 2.32. Again, in the Scriptures, proof of the Scriptures. Joel 2.32. Did you know that Joel 2.32 says, Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. He's proved it. Christ is the end of the law so that there might be righteousness for everyone who believes. And the question that hangs in the balance this morning is an eternal question of God's reckless pursuit of you to this moment. Have you? Have you believed? And in the the moments that lie ahead, God is tenderly calling you. His Spirit is here compelling you to come to the cross where salvation is found in your declaration of faith in Christ Jesus as Lord. This morning, I want to invite you. If you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ, God has led us to this wonderful passage, Romans 10, 4 through 13, just for you. I used to call them holy hookups. That is when you were surprised that God was following you so close and you turned and you were embraced by his love and were forever saved. Maybe that's how you're going to respond this morning by turning to Christ, putting your faith in him this morning. You say, how do I do that? You simply... You simply talk to God. You can say with your head bowed right now, you can say, Father, that's you're talking to God. I am a sinner. And I'm in need of a Savior. And I understand today that your Son, Jesus Christ, was sent to be my Savior. And I want to put my trust in Him this morning. I, I believe. I want to just simply confess with my mouth that you, Jesus, are Lord, and believe in my heart that you, God, have raised Jesus from the dead, and that's to secure my salvation. I trust you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In your name I pray. Amen. Listen, you pray that. You mean that with your heart, and you have become a child of God. You've been born again, and that's a wonderful moment that we all want to celebrate, so you need to tell someone. Because just as when babies are born, I think most of you were born in a hospital. We just had a baby who was born in our, in our church at home by a midwife. It's beautiful. Her name is Alaska. Maybe she'll be here um, in one of the weeks to come, and we'll get to celebrate her. But listen, when that baby was born, they didn't say, okay, man, I hope you have a good time, Alaska. I hope you make it in this hard thing called life. No, man, they, they started coddling her and wrapping her in cloths and, and feeding her and changing her and taking care of all of her needs. Well, when you're born again as a child of God, well, you, you come in as a baby, and so you need to be nurtured. That's why we have a family, a body of Christ to, to do that. We have God's Word, which is uh, when we, we, we can 
break it down to just be milk so you can just enjoy the favor of God and his promises that are for you. And you grow in that, right? And so we don't want you to journey alone. We want to journey with you. We want to help you to grow as a believer in Christ. So that's why we invite you to come to make your declaration of faith uh, public. And, and that's why I'm standing here this morning. That's why we have the card. You can mark it on the back hand. I want to become a follower my trust in Jesus Christ. Maybe you've already done that before, but you've never followed in believer's baptism. I'm listening. The only qualification for being baptized is if you're a believer. Once you're a believer, you've met all the qualifications, and you could go through the waters immediately and, and show that as an act of obedience to, to, to God for setting you free and a testimony to everyone else about what has happened to you that you've been set free from your sins, that you've been raised to walk in a new life of Jesus Christ. You can mark that on your card, and, and in one of the Sundays to come, we can set it up for you. It's not hard. It's very simple. You just have to tell me that you're willing. Because you've trusted Christ, you're ready. You just have to be willing. Maybe you say, well, I've already trusted Christ. I've already followed in believer's baptism, but I'm going to tell you that my life has been kind of wheels off. I haven't been communicating to anyone about the love and joy of, of walking with Jesus Christ. It, it's evaded me because I've been stubbornly resisting God's plan for my life. Maybe you want to come back into a, a solid relationship with the Lord. You want to rededicate your life to Him. Well, that time, this time is now, right? You could do that in this time as well. Maybe you just have a big burden and you need somebody to pray for uh, with you. I, I'd love to pray for you this morning. There's other people in our body who've gone through similar things. I'm certain of it. And we could uh, hook you up with one of those people to help you walk through this hard time. Remind you that God has not left you for sin. Well, whatever your need is this morning, this is our time. Would you stand as we stand and sing as God leads?